Well, good morning. We are working on session two of our series, Caring for Each Other in the Body of Christ. And we're going to spend a number of weeks working through some texts that help us understand how vital it is for us to be together and to labor on behalf of one another in the body of Christ. This morning's message is simply titled, Your Brother's Keeper. Our text we will be looking at is Hebrews 10, verses 23 to 27, and you can turn there. It was Cain who famously asked God, Am I my brother's keeper? Cain had murdered his brother Abel. And so his question was not honest, it was a deflection, it was a tactic to get God, the investigator, off of his investigative trail. The sad reality is that Cain should have been his brother's keeper. They lived, after all, outside of the garden, after the fall of humanity into sin. The ground was cursed, humans were corrupt, and the earth would grow increasingly violent. It was a dangerous world. You and I inhabit that same dangerous world. And I want to draw your attention this morning to a particular danger for those who follow Christ. It is the danger of apostasy. The danger of falling away from being a follower of Christ. This morning as part two in our series on caring for one another in the body of Christ, we'll be looking at Hebrews 10 and it is a warning against falling away. The danger of apostasy is very real. In fact, the entire letter to the Hebrews serves as a warning against following away. Hebrews 10 is one of those critical, practical remedies against apostasy. Whose responsibility is it to not wander away from Jesus? Is it Jesus' responsibility? Is it the Father's responsibility? Is it the Holy Spirit's responsibility? Is it your responsibility? Is it our responsibility? That's what we will look at this morning. And our introduction this morning has its own outline, a bit unconventional. That means buckle up, this is going to be a long introduction. And we just want to talk a little bit about apostasy. Apostasy is deliberate, permanent departure from following Jesus. And I want us to meditate on what the Bible says about the dangers of apostasy for a few moments. When the followers of Jesus stop following Jesus, this is a revealing of false profession of Christianity. And apostasy is an insidious treason. It is a treacherous sin committed by insiders by those who are close to Christ, those who have seen Christ's work, those, as the author of Hebrews said, have tasted of heavenly things. And this treachery, this departing from fidelity or loyalty to Christ, committed by insiders, leads to eternal destruction. You may remember the heart-wrenching scene at the end of John chapter 6. Jesus had won the popularity contest. His opinion polls were soaring. He had fed the masses instantaneously, miraculously with food that did not previously exist. And the crowd's response to this remarkable work was found in John 6.15. They intended to come and take him by force and make him king. But Jesus withdrew. And the implication of Jesus' withdrawal alone on the mountain by himself to pray, away from this swell of popular opinion, is pretty striking. The implication is, do you want Christ for who Christ is, or something of a free lunch? And when Jesus pressed the idolatries of the hearts of the crowd, the crowd walked away, and they were not believing in him anymore says John 6:67. 6, Look around you this morning. No doubt there are people in this room who are walking with Jesus today who will at some point withdraw and not be walking with him any longer. Consider your small group. Who might it be? We we might all be asking at this moment, is it I, Lord? There is a list of people in my own life, pastors, missionaries, friends, family members, people I've evangelized, people I've baptized, 
who have walked away from following Christ. And our world is populated by many people who used to be Christian. The hashtag exvangelical is a popular tag on social media. There were some in the first generations of the church. Some are named in Scripture. Hymenaeus and Alexander in 1 Timothy 1. Philetus in 2 Timothy 2. Demas in 2 Timothy 4. Diotrephes in 3 John. There were pastors amongst the Ephesian elders in Acts 20 that Paul indicated who had been fellow workers with Paul for the labor for the church who would then betray the truth. One of the original 12, Judas, was an insider and a traitor. There are some who not only walk away from the faith, but also compel others to walk away. And this is especially dangerous. They carry with them a very compelling argument. I used to be a Christian. Have you met anybody like this? It's the been there, done that argument. It's a foolish argument, frankly, but it is very compelling. Someone who has experience with a way of thinking, experience with the person and work of Jesus Christ, experience with the church, and then for one reason or another walks away. They carry around with them the card, I tried that, it doesn't work. The argument is something like, I used to believe in gravity. Again, it's a foolish argument, but it is compelling. And for one who stands at the top of a building saying, I used to believe in gravity, he may take others with him on a leap off the edge. And so the New Testament provides us with warnings against falling away. I have these verses listed in the notes available on the web. And you can get those references here. You don't have to write them all down. But I will reference them and then read these portions. Matthew 13, beginning in verse 3. Jesus spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell beside the road, and birds came and ate them up. Others fell on rocky places where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up because they had no depth of soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Others fell among thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out. And others fell on good soil and yielded a crop a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. And in that parable, the seed is the gospel and the ground is the hearts of hearers. And plants grow. But only one plant, the last one, represents a good heart that receives the seed of the gospel. All the rest grow, they they look like plants, and they wither away. It is possible to look like a Christian and not be one. Luke 9, 62, Jesus said, no one, after putting his hand to the plow and then looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says this, I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Vain belief or shallow belief or truly unbelief will not hold fast to the word preached 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Paul warns this, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? Paul there is writing to a church filled with people who profess faith and follow Christ. In Colossians 1, there is this warning. God has reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach, if indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. In 1 Timothy 1, verse 18, This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight, 
keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan so that they will be taught not to blaspheme. That's a remarkable passage. Paul tells Timothy, who was prophesied over, who had direct promises relating to him, and Paul encourages him, fight, keep up the fight. Do not reject a clean conscience. Do not make shipwreck of your faith. In 1 Timothy 4.1, Paul says, The Spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. In 2 Timothy, Paul gives this warning. It is a trustworthy statement. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. And God's faithfulness there is his faithfulness to keep his promise to deny those who deny him. 2 Timothy 2, verse 16. Here's this warning. Avoid worldly and empty chatter. It will lead to further ungodliness. Their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place. And they upset the faith of some. 2 Timothy 4.10, Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted. Hebrews 3, verse 12, Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ, If we hold fast to the beginning of our assurance, firm until the end. Hebrews 6, beginning in verse 4. In the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, they've tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away. It is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucified to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Hebrews 10, verse 26, If we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of fire which will consume the adversaries. Hebrews 10, 38 says, The righteous one will live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Peter warns, 2 Peter 1, 10, Brethren, Be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. 2 Peter 2, verse 1. False prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. 2 Peter 2.20 says, If, after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, if they are again entangled in them and are overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. And the Apostle John explains in 1 John 2.19, They went out from us, but they were not really of us. If they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out so that it would be shown that they are all not of us. The warnings against apostasy are threaded throughout the New Testament. What are the causes of apostasy? There are internal and external pressures to walk away from Jesus. There are enemies within and there are enemies without. One cause of apostasy in the New Testament is persecution. Persecution has a way of weeding out false profession, shallow faith, convenient Christianity. False teachers, destructive heresies, bad doctrine. That was the issue at the church in Galatia. There were those who were teaching against the gospel and leading people astray. There are skeptics and philosophers, sophisticated reasonings, modernism. 
The Colossians were vulnerable to these things. To be unstable, unrooted, blown around by every wind of doctrine or intellectually gullible is to be like a sand foundation in an earthquake or a rootless tree in a hurricane. Christians, we must know the truth. For when philosophies come from within or philosophies threaten from without, if we do not know the truth, we will be vulnerable. A fourth cause of apostasy is riches. Riches. Simply loving wealth and the ease and comfort and notoriety that come with it. Fifth, a love of the world. A love of our temporal existence, whether it be work or recreation, some relationship and entertainment, material goods. These things begin to have more value to us than Jesus. And so one would gain the world but forfeit a soul. Fear of man is a pressure to apostasy. Peer pressure, what what everybody else is doing, what all the world around us seems to want and to go after. Sin, unchecked, unrepentant, unbroken, unfought sin, sensual enjoyment, the pursuit of sin in an unbroken way. One form of apostasy is the pull of old religious life. That was the case in the life of the audience to the letter of the Hebrews. We'll dig into that a little bit more this morning. Unchecked doubt is a pathway to apostasy. Truth slippage. We start to just have these little seeds of doubt about God's word. We start to elevate our own thoughts above God's thoughts. We start to think we have a handle on the truth or we begin to listen to skeptics. And those seeds of doubt grow. They're not fought or combated with the truth. We're not in the habit of renewing our minds, Romans 12, 2. But we have made a habit or a pattern of standing in the way of sinners, sitting in the seat of scoffers. There's sometimes a real view of the cost of following Jesus becomes a source of apostasy. Well, I thought I could just add a little bit of Jesus to my life and everything would go well. But you're saying that identifying myself with Christ and his people is going to cost me things I love? I wasn't in for that. Sometimes a shallow preaching of the gospel, an easy believism, makes an easy pathway to apostasy. Another pathway to apostasy is simple spiritual apathy, laziness. Instead of when Christianity is hard, this happens when Christianity is easy. There are no threats to my spiritual life because I've identified with Christ. I can go through the motions and nobody bothers me. But real spiritual discipline, a pursuit of the Lord from the heart, is absent. It's a pathway to apostasy. And then isolation. And this is where apostasy hits home for the series we're in currently. Removing yourself from the preserving influence of other believers. You've no doubt heard the illustration often used of a coal removed from a hot fire will burn out by itself. When we remove ourselves from Christian fellowship, when we cease gathering together on the Lord's day with fellow believers to do the things that God has ordained as a means for preserving faith, we will find faith wane. That could very well be a pathway to apostasy. Of course, the bottom line cause of all apostasy is simply an unregenerate heart. But you have to understand, we can fool ourselves. We can believe, because we have the external trappings of Christianity, that we are okay with God. And those who walk away prove themselves never to have been born again. Christian, what are the seeds of unbelief in your own heart? As you think about your life, you think about the past week, the past month, the past year... 
What are those things that creep in and produce cold affections towards Christ or a hard heart toward the Word of God or ambivalence toward the cross of Christ or a lack of love for God's people? Let's talk about protections from apostasy. Who is responsible for the preservation of God's people? Is God responsible for that? A triune yes, absolutely. Listen to 1 Peter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. God preserves his elect. We were just in John chapter 10 and Jesus, the good shepherd says this, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give to them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. And Paul recounts in Ephesians 1 verse 13, in Christ, you also, after listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. God, the father, God, the son, God, the Holy Spirit are eternally committed to the elect to preserve them forever. It is a true biblical doctrine to articulate once saved, always saved. The question at stake in apostasy is the reality that not all who claim to be Christians, not all who think they are Christians, not all who look like Christians are actually Christians. And there will be those who fall away. And so the individual is responsible biblically. To maintain his faith. Listen to Jude 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. And you can open up your Bibles and find many commands to persevere, to endure. And lest you think for a moment that we have jettisoned the biblical doctrine of eternal security, we need to recognize the relationship between security and perseverance. God preserves the believer. And the believer perseveres. That is, a believer, a genuine believer, a born-again believer, keeps on believing. Because believers fight an enduring battle against unbelief at the heart level. And that battle is waged on many fronts and in every era of the Christian life until we go home. How do you know someone is a genuine believer? That belief endures to the end. And we know that God uses means to keep his elect. One of those means, Christian, is you staying in the faith, keeping faith. It is your labor and your striving to hold fast your confession without wavering. That is your responsibility. And another means, and the one we're focusing on in this series, is the church. How does God keep his elect? By placing them by his Holy Spirit into a body of believers so that they would be interconnected, interdependent parts of a body that need one another, that care for one another, that feel one another's hurts, that meet one another's needs. It is the church, the gathered body of believers, intended by God to be a means of preserving spiritual life, of enduring faith and loyalty to Christ. So whose responsibility is it to keep the believer? Is it ours? Am I my brother's keeper? And the answer to that is yes. Yes, Christian, you are your brother's keeper. Let's turn our attention to Hebrews chapter 10. And let's read this passage before us, beginning in verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. 
And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. In my English Bible, there is a break between verse 25 and 26. There's a paragraph heading, and there's a bold number 26 indicating a new idea. I think those breaks are unhelpful here in this text. Verse 26 begins with the conjunction, the little word for... And it connects what happens in verse 26 and following with the prior section. And it connects it in a really remarkable way. You may be familiar with Hebrews 10.25. It's the you have to go to church verse. right? It's the proof text for your friend who slept in on Sunday morning. He went to Bedside Baptist or Pillow Creek Community Church. And you think Hebrews 10.25, you got to go to church, man. This is the verse. And don't disconnect Hebrews 10.25 from Hebrews 10.26. And here's the connection. We must gather together in person, visibly, on the Lord's day. Because apostasy, that's the argument. We need to be together because falling away from faith is a real thing. And the gathered church is one of God's means for keeping his elect. So test yourself to see if you're in the faith. One of the measurements of that test is, do I gather with God's people? Is that my ethos? Is that my habit? Is that my custom? And the corollary to that, uh, I don't go to church when it's inconvenient, when it's difficult, when I get burned by relationships, when I think I can do this on my own, I can bootstrap my spiritual life in my living room. I can listen to sermons online. Any other substitute for the local church visibly gathered And you connected to it vitally. Any of those substitutes ought to be a red flag in your heart of the pathway of apostasy. It's like one of those electronic billboards on the freeway. This road leads away from Christ. These sections are connected. I want to sum up this section for you this way. This is the main idea of this passage. God protects his people from apostasy through the active participation of believers in each other's life. God protects his people from apostasy through the active participation of believers in each other's life. And we'll split this passage up into two sections. The first is simply this. God commands vigilant interdependence. God commands vigilant interdependence. That'll take us verses 23 through 25. And the reason God commands vigilant interdependence is because apostasy brings dire consequences. That'll take us through verses 26 and 27. It's not likely that we will cover all of this this morning. God protects his people from apostasy through the active participation of believers in each other's life. Just notice in verse 23 and 24, both of these verses begin with, let us. Now in the English, this doesn't sound like commands. This sort of seems like corporate permission. But in the original, this is a command. It is, us do. And there's no good English equivalent to saying, all of us do something. But that's the import of these verses. 
And and these commands are a command to corporate public fidelity, uh, holding fast to our confession. And those first-person plural pronouns, our confession, that is intended to indicate that us together... We together have something that we together are to hold on to, to grip tight, to cling to with a white knuckle grip. We are to hold fast our confession in verse 23. And then in verses 24 and 25, we are to think carefully. That is a thoughtful, mutual exhortation. We're to look around the room and we're to think about each other. And we're to think about one another carefully, deeply, intently with the goal of exhorting one another. To stir one another up. To bring about something of a loving irritant, a a provocation unto love and good works. The Christian life ought to be marked by these things. When we're not marked by these things, we get around each other and we encourage each other to these two things. The Hebrews, that is the Jews who lived in Jerusalem, who had believed in Jesus, who are the audience of this letter originally, they faced very challenging temptations. Temptations to walk away from Christ. And I want, this, I want to set the scene for us a little bit this morning. Could you imagine being a Jew and following Jesus of Nazareth as the Christ or the Messiah? The anointed one, the holy one, the promised one that all the Old Testament looked forward to. That the Old Testament sacrifices were a hint and shadow and a precursor to. And then Jesus is born in Bethlehem as a baby, lives a perfect life, and then lives out a three-year public ministry. And it is unmistakable to you that he is indeed a man, but he is no ordinary man. He is the God-man. God has come and tabernacled among us. He has taken on flesh and dwelt among us. And he has performed supernatural acts that demonstrate his identity. And this God-man, Jesus, a descendant of David, is the Son of Man promised. He is the Messiah who would be king over all the earth and sit on the Davidic throne and rule over the nations with a rod of iron. And when he came, he came to be not first of all a conquering king, But in his first coming, he came to be a suffering servant. And he fulfilled the great promises of Isaiah 53, that he would take in himself the punishment due God's people. That he would be that lamb of sacrifice. And when Jesus went to a cross, crucified there by Roman soldiers, betrayed by the nation and the religious leadership, And betrayed by the insider, Judas. He hung on that cross between heaven and earth as the one mediator between God and man. And he bore in his body all of the infinite wrath due for our sins, our crimes, our evil deeds. For everyone who would believe, past, present, and future sins were placed on Jesus the Christ At the cross. And his suffering was not merely at the hands of the Roman soldiers. Not merely at the hands of the Jewish leadership and a riotous mob. But under the crushing weight of the infinite justice of his father. That was the infinite agony at the cross. Where Jesus wrapped himself in our sins and bore them before his holy father. And suffered as if he had committed all of those crimes. And if you were a first century Jew in Jerusalem and had believed that, you were a pariah. Because according to the Jewish leadership and according to the majority of the nation of Israel who had rejected Jesus of Nazareth as Messiah, you were following a scandal. 
Because anyone that hung on a tree was cursed by God. A cursed one could not be the Messiah. And he was puny. He couldn't help himself down off of the tree after all of the claims that he made, after all the claims that others made about him. He couldn't save himself in their view. And so you were following one who was a shame and a scandal in Jewish eyes. And in the eyes of the Romans, someone who was just weak and puny. And all of it was foolish, worthy of ridicule. But the Jewish community was tight. To be a follower of Jesus was likely to bring about being desynagogued disfellowshipped, removed from your culture. For many Jews in the first century, it involved being labeled atheists. Because they were rejected by Judaism and they did not worship the gods of the Romans, they were called God-rejectors altogether. When in fact, they were worshipers of the one true God. And to be rejected by Judaism meant to be rejected by your family. To follow Jesus meant to be rejected by mom and dad, brother and sister, an employer or employees. In many cases, it meant being unable to buy or sell in the marketplace, unable to fend for yourself, unable to get work. Meanwhile, prior to A.D. 70, that temple in Jerusalem still stood this letter to the Hebrews was written prior to the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem by Titus Vespasian in 70 AD. Imagine what it would be like to be a Jew having followed Jesus of Nazareth while the temple still stood. The doors were open. The priests offered sacrifices. Animals were brought in daily. Their throats were slit. Their blood was spilled. The ceremonies were done. The blood ran out the bottom of the building, down into the valley below, as a reminder that God had made a way for sinners to be forgiven. Day after day, year after year, decade after decade, generation after generation, since the installment of Mosaic Law, animals had been killed as a marker that an innocent would stand in the place of the guilty. Christ had come. Christ died on the cross. Do you remember the remarkable thing God did at the temple when Christ said it is finished? The temple separating the holiest section from the outer sections was torn top to bottom. An emblem that the work of sacrificial substitutional offering was done and that the mediation between God and man in the once and final offering of Jesus Christ was forever finished. And thenceforth, animal sacrifices carried out in that temple would be completely empty and devoid of meaning. They had meaning. They were instigated by God. They were installed by God to point towards what God would do in Christ. But after Christ came, they were done. And the nation that rejected Christ as sacrifice continued to carry out the foreshadow sacrifices. They continued to act as if the, the temple curtain had not been torn, as if the finished work had not been done. And what an offense to a holy God that was. To reject the perfect sacrifice and to go about mechanical, religious, empty human contrivances. And so the box, the, the building, the, the temple still stood. It, it cast a long shadow over Jews who followed Jesus in the first century. And that shadow, according to the book of Hebrews, created for them a temptation to waver in belief. To waver into unbelief. And think about the temptation. You follow Jesus, life just got hard. Mom and dad don't like you anymore. They do not call you son. <laughs> Financial hardship ensues. And according to the book of Hebrews, some had their property plundered simply because they were followers of Jesus. Christian, I don't know what you've suffered. I don't know what it has cost you to follow Christ. 
Maybe it has cost you family relationships. Maybe it has cost you in the workplace. Maybe it has cost you in sports teams and school place, in neighborhoods. Perhaps friendships have been cut off. Maybe it makes an uncomfortable Thanksgiving dinner with unbelieving family members. But put yourself in the shoes of the first century Jews who had the looming temptation of their entire identity, their entire culture, their entire way of living down to the way they ate, pressuring them to come back. Look, forget following this Jesus. Forget this silly escapade you're on. Just give up that scandalous, shameful, empty hope that that guy from the wrong side of tracks was supposedly the Messiah. Just give up on that and come back home. You can have your family back. You can have your job back. You can have the comforts of life back. We'll give you back your plundered property. Those were real temptations to fall away from Christ. And so the book of Hebrews has warnings. Think back to Hebrews chapter 3. We read it earlier. Verse 12. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another. That demands we be around each other. Look at chapter 4. Therefore, let us fear, if while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. Look at chapter 6, verse 4. In the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, they've tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put Him to open shame. For ground that drinks the rain which often falls on it and brings forth vegetation, useful to those for whose sake it is tilled, receives a blessing. But if it yields thorns and thistles, it is worthless, close to being cursed, and ends up being burned. The faith that is demanded here requires diligence. Look at chapter 10 and verse 26. If we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Verse 26 has been mistaken to believe that if you sin after being a Christian, you lose your salvation. That is not the point. Sinning here is the sin of the treachery of rejecting Christ as the one Messiah and going back to the temple, going back to the sacrifices out of fear of man, out of peer pressure to conform, out of the thought that that which is visible and tangible is more believable than what I can't see and can't touch. Listen, the temple sacrifices were very compelling. There were animals that you would drag into the building. There was blood that you could smell, blood that you could see. There was a mechanical ceremony that was done. It was visible. All of this was very tangible. And sometimes what we see and taste and feel and touch is more compelling than what God's word says. Have you felt this? So to believe God's word against your feelings, against your senses, against your eyes is the definition of faith. That's why Hebrews 11 and the hall of faith exist there. What is the definition of faith in uh, chapter 11, verse 1? It is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And then you get the description of all those who did not see, did not taste, did not touch that which was promised, but believed. Christian, you may not be a Jew in the first century having turned to follow a scandalous Messiah. 
But there are comforts in an old life. There are things which entice from your pre-Christian days. There may be pressures that you feel from peers or from family members. The theme of the letter to the Hebrews is don't leave Christ for personal comfort. Don't turn your back on Christ. The point of uh, chapter 10, verse 26, if you sin after having received the knowledge of the truth, that is, you turn away from Christ to go back to the temple and those sacrifices, the glory of God has left the building. The sacrifices are empty. There is no more sacrifice for you anymore. You reject the one true sacrifice for sin provided by God, and there is no other provision. If we advance the principle to our own day, we, we've got to think about it this way. You who have been on the circumference, maybe you've heard about Christ, maybe you own a Bible and it sits on your shelf, maybe you've been a church attender your whole life, maybe you've seen others' lives transformed by supernatural power, but you're on the outskirts. You haven't experienced a radical transformation from the heart. Listen, at some point, following Jesus will be uncomfortable and you will walk away. (laughs) And to have grasped onto something of Christ, to have been exposed to the knowledge of Christ, and then to say, Christ isn't enough. He's not good. The gospel doesn't work. The Bible's not true. It arms your heart with the been there, done that argument. I've tasted and I've seen no good. Friend, there is no hope for you outside of Christ. My encouragement to you is don't just taste. Don't be a a, a Christian in name only. Don't be a a cultural Christian. Don't come to truth about Christ at a superficial level and walk. Because, friend, you are on very dangerous ground to do so. We'll dig into these verses in detail next week. What we will discover is that we need each other. We need each other in the body of Christ We need to encourage each other while it's still called today. And we need to remember how these two sections are joined. We stimulate one another to love and good deeds. We hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. We do not forsake our assembling together and our encouraging of one another for apostasy. To walk away from Christ To walk away from the means by which God preserves his people is to walk into the expectation of a fury of fire and a righteous judgment. Let's pray. Lord God, you are good. And it seems that you know us. You know our hearts and you know our inclinations. You know how desperately we need you. How desperately we need your provisions your protections, how desperately we need your means of grace, your means of preservation, particularly the church gathered together regularly, visibly, to sit under your word, to join our hearts in songs of praise, to pray together, to minister to one another, to celebrate the Lord's table and baptisms, to embrace your process of discipline, to love as the world cannot love, a selfless sacrificial love and good deeds produced by your Holy Spirit that the world knows nothing of, those things which mark us out as truly belonging to you, all of these things serve not only to bring you glory on this earth, but to keep us in your love. Lord, we thank you that you keep your own and you will never let them go. And we pray to be those who hold on to you with a white knuckle grip of faith that you produce. And we ask it in Jesus name. Amen.